What an amazing journey. As we have seen in the video, Taiwan's cooperation with the new southbound countries is not limited just to economy, trade, supply chains, but it also includes healthcare, education, talent exchange, agriculture, cultural exchanges, and a wide range of other areas, demonstrating Taiwan's warm power, as mentioned by our chairperson, Michael Xiao. So today, we are going to ex explain to you the important achievements of the new southbound policy over the last seven years, which have opened new opportunities for Taiwan, pushing economic, technological, cultural exchanges with our neighbors. Taiwan hopes to share resources, talent, and markets with the new southbound partners while creating a new and mutually beneficial model for cooperation. These efforts have built a sense of economic community and enabled Taiwan to integrate more fully into the regional economy. And one of the key figures behind the new sound policy is the Honorable John Deng, Minister Without Portfolio, Executive Yuan, Republic of China, Taiwan. So later, we will be honored to invite the Honorable John Deng, Minister Without Portfolio from the Executive Yuan, who is also the chief negotiator behind the scene, to come up to the stage to share with us the seven-year milestone of the new soundbound policy. And as you can see from the video, we have seen all kinds of exchanges, including resource sharing, regional connectivity, and with like-minded countries from South and South Asia to Australia and New Zealand. And definitely, I also want to mention that tomorrow in the Glory Room 1, there will be a special exhibition of the new soundbound policy, as mentioned by Chairman Xiao right in the beginning. The TAEF has done a wide range of research and published a lot of papers on the substantial and substantive results of the new sound bell policy. And later, I'm confident that our Minister Without Portfolio, John Deng, is going to give us a briefing about the important achievements of the new sound bell policy. So ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, please put your hands together to welcome the Honorable John Deng, Minister Without Portfolio of the Executive Yuan, Republic of China, Taiwan, to come up to the stage, please. Uh, I'm really impressed by the uh, efficiency of the uh, hotel staff <laughs> for very quickly arrange a new uh, sitting for us. Uh, Dr. Xia, Chairman of the uh, Taiwan Asia Exchange Foundation, distinguished panelists and moderators, distinguished participants, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very much honored to welcome you here and uh, provide some information and some thought before we start today's session. Right after President Tsai first launched the new Southbound policy in 2016, all of the relevant government agencies very quickly engaged with business, academia, and civil society to formulate a plan of action. We then work with our partner countries to, de to develop the implementation program based on the need of the local community. The past seven years have seen the accumulation of many tangible results. Today, we have invited several government leaders whose agencies have, have participated in those efforts, as well as experts from abroad to examine the result of those programs and to have in-depth discussion on ways forward. Uh, 
，谢谢。Taiwan is a part of the Indo-Pacific region. We seek to forge a strong relationship with our partners, aiming to share prosperity, benefits, resources, and vision. In essence, the new South Bank policy has evolved to embrace not just the investment and trade, but also the cultivation of holistic goodwill among the countries in the region. Thanks to our concerted efforts, Taiwan and our partner countries have made significant strides in areas such as education, agriculture, healthcare, disaster pre prevention, investment, finance, and cultural exchange. Through cooperation, we have embarked on a rewarding journey towards shared values and goals. It gives me a great pleasure to have taken part in this important policy, which especially benefits young people, women, small and medium business, those groups who generally have less resources and even underprivileged. Because of the new Southbound policy, Taiwan has formed a much resilient supply chain with countries in Southeast Asia and India as a result. According to our Ministry of Economic Affairs, accumulation of Taiwan's outbound investment to those des destinations increased from US 23, uh, 32.7 billion in 2016 to US 57.6 billion by June 2023 an increase of 76.2%. Taiwan's trade with new Southbound policy partner countries also surged from US 96 billion in 2016 to US 180 billion in 2022. Uh, this is an increase of 88.8% much bigger growth than that of the trade with other part of the world in the same period. Taiwan places special emphasis on education. This approach fosters many educational collaborations that invite students from our neighboring countries to pursue higher education in Taiwan, and also provide them the opportunity of internship so that they can gain on-hand experiences in the factories. Seven years of cooperation has resulted in the increase of this student body from 32,000 in 2016 to almost 70,000 in 2022. More than 10,000 of those graduates got jobs in Taiwan in 2023, 2022 alone. Despite of those achievements I mentioned earlier, we shall, not, we shall continue our efforts. We must set higher goals and extend our reach. We aspire to collaborate with our partner countries, hoping to contribute even more to the promotion of peace and stability in the Indo-Pacific region. We are pleased to see that Yusan Forum has become one of the most important platforms in the region for the discussion of regional cooperation. This year's forum is not only a milestone, but also a new beginning. We believe that after two days of discussion, new ideas will emerge so as to benefit just, not just Indo-Pacific region, but the whole world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister Zheng, for sharing with us the wonderful results of the new soundbound policy. Please take your seat on the stage. And now we are going to move on to session one, economic and trade collaboration, forging resilient supply chains. Now we would like to welcome the panelists to come up to the stage. Please welcome Chen Zhengqi, CC Chen, Deputy Minister of Ministry of Economic Affairs, ROC Taiwan.
Zhou Zhihao, Deputy Minister of Ministry of Health and Welfare, ROC Taiwan. Gao Xiangui, Deputy Minister of National Development Council, ROC Taiwan. His Excellency Matt Murray, United States Senior Official for APEC, Department of State, USA. The Honorable Tim Grosser, Chair of Grosser and Associates, New Zealand. Also, Kenneth Y. Hardigan Go, former Under Secretary of the Department of Health, the Philippines. Please come up to the stage and take your seat. And the moderator for this session is Mr. John Deng, Minister Without Portfolio of the Executive Yuan, ROC Taiwan. Minister Deng, the floor is yours. Thank you. Please take your seat. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, this session uh, is for discussion of uh, economic and trade collaborations, uh, forging resilient supply chain. We have, on schedule, we have one hour, but it is running a little bit late. So we'll try uh, to do as fast as we can. Uh, we have a very distinguished six panelists uh, in this session. And uh, very quickly, uh, I'll introduce them uh, to, to you. The first one on my right side is Deputy Minister from the Economic Affairs, Mr. Chen, Chen Zhengqi. And uh, the next one, next to him, is uh, Deputy Minister of Health, uh, Dr. Uh, Zhou Zhihao. The next one is uh, uh, Deputy Minister of the National Development Council, uh, Gao Xiangui. Uh, the next one is Ambassador Matt Murray. He just gave us uh, a speech. And in your speech, you pretty much introduced yourself. Uh, but we are very much honored uh, to have uh, uh, Ambassador Murray with us. And the next one is Minister and Ambassador Tim Grosser from New Zealand. Uh, this, I know uh, Ambassador Grosser for some time, and uh, he's uh, a world-class thinker on, on many, many uh, international economic issues. So. Uh, thank, uh, thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Grosser, for coming to this session. And uh, the next one, the first, uh, is uh, uh, Under Secretary of Kenneth Hartingen Go, the former Under Secretary of Department of Health from the Philippines. Uh, thank you very much for coming. So uh, let's start uh, our discussion, and uh, uh, I have to uh, try to uh, limit. Uh, the uh, time of each speaker. I thought we had, uh, we have, we can have eight minutes, but now please uh, try to uh, make your uh, presentation in six minutes. Uh, then we can leave some time for the audience to ask questions or uh, we can uh, have some discussion among the panelists. So let's start with uh, um, Deputy Minister uh, Chen. Okay, uh, thank you, Minister. So let me uh, start. Uh, when uh, on the economic collaboration of uh, New South Bank policy, the NSB policy, uh, we have uh, four policy objectives. When President Tsai took office in 2016, during the time, Taiwan's export uh, to mainland China occupied more than 40%. And Taiwan's investment in mainland China in China uh, occupy more than 44%. That certainly is not a healthy situation and not sustainable. So the first policy objective is to diversify our market and to increase the resilience of our economy. And second policy uh, consideration was uh, the uh, New South Bank policy area, the countries, they have a, uh, a tremendous demographic benefits, demographic uh, advantage where we like to leverage and grow with them. And those young people, they aspire for new technology, aspire for new development, aspire into a new era. And the third consideration is when we open up our trade investment with China in the 90s, uh, we also encourage our investors to go to Southeast Asia. And then those Taiwanese diaspora has laid a very solid foundation. So we like to leverage that situation to deepen and enhance 
our collaboration and our uh, uh, integration with the region and make us a, a member of the communities. So we have a four policy objective. The first one is diversi diversification of the market and deployment into the NSB region. And then it's working with the local, gov uh, local business to enter global supply chains and then collaborate with the countries to advance their industries. And then uh, we, uh, we have a vision to grow and prosper together. And this one has been uh, much talk about, about the uh, milestone of uh, this report card. After seven years, the investment now we have uh, about 34% uh, went to the new southbound countries. Uh, that started from 11% of our outbound investment. So that, that is a tremendous growth, about 120% growth. And then uh, I'd like to uh, uh, spend a few minutes, uh, uh, a few I don't, a few minutes, but uh, two, one minute. On the trade, uh, President Tsai and Minister Dan talk about the trade growth. Of course, we have a very significant growth on trade, which is 88% growth of our uh, export to the NSB countries. But I'd like to also mention, in terms of proportion of our, our export to uh, NSB countries, that's a growth of 19% to 20%. You will see this is very meager, it's very little. But I'd like to point out, during President Tsai's uh, office, our uh, total foreign trade actually grew 78%. So that is a policy objective. Like uh, through the NSB policy, we make the cake, the foreign trade cake, much bigger, much healthier, and much more substantial. And second, this is facilitated by the Asian economies, mostly uh, investment-driven uh, growth model. So the investment uh, increase also drew, uh, trade increase also drew enhanced of uh, trade relations. And also, that also signify the supply chain movement. Actually, uh, our, ex our export to uh, China uh, this year dropped 23%. That is a, a symbol of the supply chain, now it's moving. So let me show you how the supply chain is moving. Uh, because Taiwanese uh, investors, they tend to be small and medium enterprise. So when we invest, we tend to grow horizontally with local business. Uh, that it has been uh, proven in our first wave of NSB, uh, no, not NSB, the Southbound policy. Uh, those Taiwanese diaspora, they established very solid the collaboration relations with the local business. And now, uh, and after seven years of NSB policies, we have seen a formation of clusters which is benefit, beneficial to the local business. We don't come into uh, come as a big conglomerate. Everything will be doing integratedly. We, on the other hand, we collaborate with the local business. So we have seen, like in Thailand, uh, there's a cluster of a PCB, which is uh, because uh, Thailand is a major producer, a production uh, area of uh, automobiles. In Vietnam, the south of Vietnam actually opened up earlier, so more conventional or traditional industry went to south part of Vietnam. But the north part of Vietnam took advantage of proximity to China, and then so many of the uh, electronic business, they went to north part of the Vietnam. And the Philippines uh, now is uh, the uh, uh, electronic assembly plant went there. In Malaysia, they have a, a packaging and testing companies a cluster. So this is the uh, achievement we have achieved in cluster. And then <clears throat> the next one I'd like to share with you is, uh, in order to facilitate this industrial collaboration, we establish platform for policy dialogue between governments. And this is what I call MIT, many in Taiwan, no, it's a, to increase manufacturing capacity through innovation and upgrading technologies. So these platforms are led by the Industrial Research Institute in Taiwan, a research institute, to help our partner countries to upgrade their industries, upgrade their technologies, then they can increase their manufacturing capacities. Through the years, we have signed 206 um, MOUs and 105 agreements reached between business. So business, they, they benefit from this networking of these platforms. And the last, 
is our vision. We like to use uh, three vehicles. The first one is to form an industrial cluster. And the second one is promoting bilateral trade and then uh, enhancing government, uh, government interactions to grow and prosper with our partners in N3 countries. Thank you. So uh, that's now. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Deputy Minister Chen. Uh, now, uh, can, uh, I would uh, invite uh, Deputy Minister Zhou from uh, Ministry of Health. Okay, thank you, Minister. In the next few minutes, I would like to present to you Taiwan's achievement and the perspective of New South Wales policy in healthcare. <clears throat> My talk will, um, my talk includes five, uh, five parts uh, as shown here. The first part is the cooperation of healthcare professional training. Mm. Taiwan government in partnership with the domestic medical center has been actively sharing Taiwan's health, healthcare expertise since the implementation of the new South Spot policy we have trained near 1,400 healthcare professionals for New South Bond countries in Taiwan. Although during, during COVID-19 pandemic, the, the number is a slightly decreased, but it's now gradually returning. The second part, international patient inflow. As we know, Taiwan healthcare services are known for their high standard, quality, and uh, reasonable prices. In recent years, we have attracted many individuals from New South Wales countries seeking medical care treatment. Our distinct medical speci uh, speci speci specialties include cardiovascular treatment, uh, craniofacial reconstruction, reproductive medicine, and more. The number of in international patients from New South Bound country in 2019 was about 104,000, nearly 40% growth comparing to uh, 2017. Due to the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, the number of medical visits to Taiwan from uh, 2020 to 2022 saw a slight decline, but it has gradually rebounded. The third part is technical exchange. We also cooperation with New South Bond countries in infectious disease prevention and control. For example, the TV control project with Vinant, Dengue prevention and control project with Indonesia, and the enterovirus prevention and the vaccine development with Vinant. During the COVID pandemic, Taiwan and the New South Bond policy partner, partner countries have continued our health cooperation uh, through the online meeting. In, two, in 2022, Taiwan and India signed an MOU on traditional medicine cooperation uh, aimed at promoting bilateral research and personnel collaboration in the field of traditional medicine. We also hold international conference and the educational training with New South Bond countries, constructing a regional joint disease prevention network through different platforms. For example, the APEC, GCTF, and the TEFINET. The, the fourth part is the sharing healthcare systems and healthcare services and products. The Ministry of Health and Welfare prioritized seven key new southbound countries, including India, Indonesia, Thailand, and the Philippines, Malaysia, Vietnam, and Myanmar. It entrusted Taiwan Medical Center to spearhead healthcare cooperation efforts, sharing Taiwan healthcare expertise and driving the exports of our pharmaceuticals and medical devices. Mm. The following are some examples of how this medical center 
uh, helps with the uh, export of Taiwan pharmaceuticals and medical devices. Zhonghua Christian Hospital collaborated with Zhonghua Telecom and Imatex to customize smart health service solution to Thai Hospital. It has established a presence in Taiwan's smart health care product and management service and serves as a showcase to promote Taiwan's smart health care products. The Chang'e Medical, Medical, Foundation, Medical Foundation has established the Taiwan Advanced Medtech Center in Malaysia. This center serves as a physical exhibition space for Taiwan medical equipment and assists the Taiwan manufacturers with representation and certification. Through the efforts of through the smart uh, through the smart healthcare seminar hosted by Zhonghua Christian Hospitals, uh, Innovate, a major Taiwanese medical electronic company, uh, successfully sold its first uh, first circulating tumor cell detection device in Thailand. The National Taiwan University also assists the Taiwanese company in obtaining the medical device license for their hemodialyzer, uh, hemodialyzer product from Indonesia. As, as of June 20, 2023, 44 companies in Taiwan has obtained more than 47,000 traditional medicine licenses, approximately 37 percent increase comparing to 20 to 17 from four new South Bound countries. And the export of Chinese herbal preparation to new South Bound partner countries in, two, in 2022 increased 70, 78% comparing to 2017s. From 2017 to the first half of 2023, a total of 29 dental material licenses has been obtained in New South Bond countries. And more than 500 oral health care professionals from New South Bond countries have received the training with the use of Taiwan, Taiwan produced medical dental materials and uh, in the training country, in the training course. The last part, future perspectives. In the future, we will continue to optimize resources integration and coordination mechanism and promote regulatory harmonization to facilitate the globalization of Taiwan healthcare industry and deepen regional healthcare cooperation with our partner countries and expand the linkage of supply chain and enhance cooperation with the world through international platforms such as APEC and we will seek cooperation with our partner countries in emerging fields, such as digital health, telehealth, smart hospital, precision medicine, and the reproductive medicine. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Deputy Minister Zhou. Uh, one comment I have to uh, share uh, with you. Uh, Deputy Minister Zhou was the director of Taiwan CDC. And uh, he is the one who uh, is trying to uh, advise us uh, during the uh, COVID-19 period of time. And he's the one who struggled to uh, provide us enough face masks and uh, to take care of the uh, patients. So this is the gentleman really uh, uh, that uh, deserve uh, our thanks and uh, our respect. Thank you very much. Uh, next, next one, uh, let's invite uh, the uh, Deputy Minister uh, Gao from National Development Council, please. Thank you. Uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Uh, I'm honored uh, to uh, represent the National Development Council for the event today. Uh, and uh, I'm pleased uh, to share with all of you the Taiwan's road in the new supply chain in Asia, who, which is working to replace the uh, mainland China's uh, role as the world's factory. 
as well as the Taiwan's uh, strategy uh, to uh, strengthen its uh, new bonds uh, with uh, economies in the Asia Pacific regions. Uh, as we all know, the, the outbreak of COVID-19 pandemic, the, the uh, rift uh, between US and uh, China, and uh, the Russia's uh, invasion of the Ukraine, and the rise of the net zero emissions uh, chain globally has dramatically uh, changed the world economic and the trade orders, as well as the rule of the global competitions. In the post-pandemic eras, many countries are striving, uh, engaged in the, in the the supply chain restructuring, uh, digital transformation, and the net zero transformation in order to uh, build a more resilient society and uh, ensure their competitive advantages. The restructuring of the global supply chain has redefined the role and the positions of the Asia countries. Uh, as you know, in the past, uh, mainland China serves as the world's factory. Uh, uh, because of the rising the geopolitical risk, uh, manufacturing uh, worldwide has searched for uh, our, our production base outside of the mainland China. The economists point out that 14 countries, including uh, Taiwan's with the uh, export uh, capabilities and the uh, skill levels uh, that uh, uh, rival those of the mainland China are able to collectively uh, replace the mainland China. These countries are referred as the uh, alternative uh, sub Asia supply chains. Uh, we firmly believe that uh, Taiwan has the abilities and the willingness to, to play an active role based on the following reasons. First, with the implementation of new southbound policies, Taiwan has established a tight uh, industrial and the trade network with new southbound policies countries. Right now, the NSP countries has surpassed uh, when in China as Taiwan's the top the foreign direct investment destinations, and the Taiwan's second largest trading partners. Secondly, uh, Taiwan uh, possesses uh, robust uh, soft power and uh, hard power. Taiwan ranked first in the world for semiconductor advanced manufacturing processes, and uh, the second in the world for IC output uh, value. And then uh, Taiwan also have the outstanding the digital talent, and uh, we share the same value of freedom and the democracy with the North, North South South countries. By the way, Taiwan is going through two transition processes. One is to accelerating the uh, development into a uh, smart nations through uh, five parts to uh, innovative industries and the six cold uh, strategies plan. The other uh, is accelerating the, the uh, transition to net zero uh, through the trapped uh, key strategies and uh, to achieve the national goals of the uh, net emissions by 2050s. Uh, Taiwan has achieved excellent results and uh, is willingness to share these results with uh, MSP countries. During the rise of the uh, new uh, Asia supply chains, uh, Taiwan is uh, uh, going to uh, stay up its effort to cooperate with the new SP countries by forging four linkages. ICT industry, smart city innovations application, startup and green energy and the low carbon 
happens for the mutual benefit and the parities. First of all, uh, our effort to strengthen the cooperation in the ICT industry. Uh, as you know, the Taiwan's the in the ICT industry have launched a new web of the investment to restructuring uh, uh, its uh, supply chains. In addition to return to invest in Taiwan, there are many moving its production capacities to new southbound policy countries, followed by the Mexico. Taiwan's you know, semiconductor you know, servers, PCB, and the electric vehicle the industries have all established the, the industrial cluster in the new southbound countries. I think the city is the best test bed for uh, digital and the net digital the transitions. Ever since uh, Taiwan uh, began implementing the, the Asia Cities Home Value programs in the 2060s, we have developed uh, 263 uh, smart city solutions, of which 45 cases uh, has been exported to the New Southbound policy countries. We have also uh, produced uh, uh, collaborative uh, results uh, together with uh, New South Bank countries in the field of the smart healthcare, smart transportation, manufacturing, and uh, agriculture. In the future, we hope to strengthen uh, uh, cooperations and we will choose the, some specific target market to establish the uh, panel to for regular exchange. Okay, Taiwan uh, ecosystem has been found, taken found uh, in the recent years uh, with uh, 7,400 uh, startups in place. We have also incubated uh, several unicorns. Uh, some of the uh, Taiwan's startups has an active presence in the, uh, in the area of the AI, uh, big data, e-commerce, and uh, uh, green, uh, uh, tech uh, greens. In uh, various Asia uh, Pacific countries, playing the role as uh, technology the, uh, innovators for the digital and the net zero the transformation. Uh, Taiwan uh, right now is currently uh, launched a uh, Initiated by the, uh, choosing the uh, uh, target specific na nations uh, to strengthen uh, uh, the linkage uh, with local uh, strategic uh, investors and uh, build a platform for regular exchange uh, to uh, strengthen the linkages. I think the net zero has uh, become a joint optic objective of various uh, countries. Taiwan uh, right now is promoting the trap the key uh, strategies, uh, and uh, we uh, have uh, set the international cooperation as a way. Uh, to uh, achieve the net zero uh, emissions. And then, uh, right now we have uh, uh, work with uh, many uh, new southbound countries uh, to uh, in the field of the uh, official wind and uh, solar power and the hydrogen power and the geothermal energies and the storage the, uh, energy storage and electric vehicles. And uh, we hope that we will continue to work with the new southbound countries uh, uh, to build a uh, new green uh, supply chains in Asia. Uh, 
Uh, finally, uh, as I mentioned uh, uh, in the beginning, the alternative leisure supply chains is rapidly you know, emerging the, during the COVID-19 uh, pandemics. Uh, with the hard power of ICT industries, as well as the soft power of an outstanding digital talent. Taiwan is going to play a key role in the new Asia uh, supply chains. Taiwan hopes to uh, work with the new South-bound policy countries to build a linear new Asia supply chains by forging the four linkages and enjoy the mutual prosperity of the digital and the net digital transformations. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Minister Gao, uh, for a very comprehensive introduction to the national uh, strategy. Thank you very much. Next one, can we invite Ambassador Matt Murray from United States? Well, thank you. Thank you, Minister Dung. And uh, again, thank you for the wonderful invitation to be here today. I really appreciate the introductions from all of the other panelists on the southbound policy. And as U.S. Senior Official for APEC, and also given that this year is the United States host year for APEC, I just wanted to take a few minutes to expand a little bit on how this year's APEC and also APEC as an institution uh, contributes to this conversation. And, you know, I think I just want to make two real main points this morning in the time that I have. Uh, the first is our theme for the U.S. APEC host year in 2023 is creating a resilient and sustainable future for all. Uh, you might uh, also think of this, given today's conversation, this is maybe a new blueprint, uh, a new way of, of looking at uh, the challenges that we face. But I think, as Deputy Minister Gao just outlined in one of her slides, we face some very significant and diverse challenges around the world, whether that's emerging from the COVID-19 pandemic, or whether that's uh, the conflict, uh, the Russia-Ukraine conflict, now conflict in the Middle East, whether that's uh, you know just slowing economies around the world, and we all have an opportunity to, to make a contribution here. But it has to be uh, in a very comprehensive way. Last year in Bangkok at the APEC uh, Leaders Week, Secretary of State Tony Blinken said that we need to meet the moment that we're in. And I think we all have that responsibility to come together as a region uh, to meet the moment. I'm very honored to be joined in particular by uh, the Honorable Tim Grosser this morning uh, because it was uh, his economy, New Zealand, which really led the way just a couple of years ago, uh, you know, hosting APEC during the COVID-19 pandemic and being able to do it all virtually uh, and also launch in the midst of that the Aotearoa Plan of Action, which really contributed to this discussion of a comprehensive approach across the region as it defined the drivers of economic growth growth as trade and investment, digitalization and innovation, and also strong, secure, sustainable, inclusive, and balanced growth. So it's been you know, New Zealand's leadership in this area that has also been critically important. So we've tried to take this forward uh, this year in the U.S. host year. We have really focused on sustainability and inclusion. Uh, it was wonderful to welcome Minister Dung to Detroit for the ministers responsible for trade meeting in May, where we really focused on sustainable and inclusive trade. Through some of the other ministerials, we've been focusing on sustainable agri-food systems, on the just energy transition, and so many other areas of looking at sustainability and inclusion. And then on the resiliency side, as we've heard from several of the panelists, focusing on resilient supply chains, focusing on food security, focusing on anti-corruption in many of these areas. And I think it's incumbent upon uh, all of us as we look ahead, whether it's within APEC or through other um, you know, opportunities, and certainly between the United States and Taiwan, we have other opportunities like the Economic uh, Partnership Prosperity Dialogue and um, the 21st Century uh, Trade Initiative to be able to look at this more comprehensive approach uh, to economic growth. And the second point I really want to make, particularly on APEC, is that Taiwan, as President Tsai said, has a key role to play as a solution, as part of the solution. And, you know, I've certainly seen in my year and a half as U.S. senior official for APEC the many ways in which Taiwan plays a leading role in APEC at the leadership ministerial working group and, and really experts level. Um, we have, I have a wonderful uh, relationship with my counterpart in APEC, Jonathan Sun, uh, the senior official, uh, as well as his predecessor, 
uh, Sharon Wu. Um, we really uh, ask a lot of Taiwan experts in the working groups, and it's been um, amazing to welcome so many ministers uh, this year to the United States uh, for uh, the eight ministerials we've had so far in Detroit and Seattle. So again, two points. We need to have a very comprehensive approach as we all seek to create uh, a resilient and sustainable future for all. And secondly, that Taiwan has a really key role to play in this process. So thank you very much again for having me. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Um, to make the uh, very clear uh, explanation of uh, what the APEC hosting country, United States, uh, view on that. Uh, this is a, a very big task uh, met. Uh, Ambassador Murray uh, is very, very busy this year and last year to prepare for the uh, coming uh, summit. So thank you very much, Ambassador Murray. Uh, now, let's invite uh, Ambassador Tim Grosser. This is a very, I look forward to hear from you uh, for many years. Now, thank you very much to uh, coming uh, to attend this session. Thank you. Please. See you, Well, thank you very much, Minister. I call you by a less formal name off the stage. Um, we've worked together for literally decades. And if I can just take the opportunity, since it's the first time I've seen you for some time, of acknowledging uh, during my seven years as Trade Minister, uh, I initiated, helped politically manage, and you did the same on the Taiwanese side the first ever FTA that Taiwan concluded with a developed country partner, and we just celebrated its 10th anniversary the other day, and I, I'm very, very proud of that achievement and want to thank you personally for everything you and your colleagues did on the Taiwanese side. But I think we're t I'm talking tomorrow on TPP and strategic trade policy, so you've asked me to say a few words on the GVC, uh, global value chains. Now, I'm not going to, and we've had some excellent presentations that have gone through some of the analytical and factual data. I'm going to stick to some very high level, essentially political points about the supply chain and the dangers facing it from far larger political forces than we can really control. And I think they're considerable. So I first really became aware of this concept of the global value chain uh, I don't know, maybe 25 years ago, when I read a brilliant study by the OECD Secretariat of what went into making one of the simplest low-tech products you could imagine, a tennis ball. And it tracked its manufacture from its origins, actually in New Zealand, because we produce the coarsest, strongest wool that is the first ingredient right through to Indonesia making the tins in which they're canned, then shipped from the Philippines to London for the world's most well-known tennis tournament. And there's some incredible figure like each tennis ball traveled 68,000 kilometers. And that's just low tech. And then I remember in 2011, there was a major volcanic <coughs> excuse me, a major volcanic explosion in, in near Reykjavik. Uh, I can, I've lost my ability to pronounce Icelandic, but it's the capital of Iceland. <laughs> and to my astonishment, all the major German car plants closed down a week later because the fine ash from the volcano closed the airspace. And I asked myself, why? Well, that's because these brilliant German companies were, were using a GIT, just-in-time supply chain management. The cost accountants had clearly gone far too far with far too low inventories. And the crucial ingredient came from right here, semiconductor chips. You know, I didn't realize back then that Taiwan, the TS, TSEM's uh, manufacturing was as essential as steel and aluminium to the manufacturing of a sophisticated motor vehicle. So that just integrated to me in my head the absolute importance of it. And the reason I'm telling this anecdote is because this word resilience isn't some new concept. This has been around in the, not just the literature of management, 
But in the actual practice of these incredible multinational corporations, of which some of the finest exist here in Taiwan, and now I fear there are serious threats of this being taken too far. So this process, which we could also describe as globalization, you all know the vast economic benefits it's made. Any one of us has read those articles. But let's just remember, this ain't just about trade and economics. It's also about human welfare, and indeed, it's ultimately about openness of political systems. Because I remember when I first went to school in Edinburgh, Scotland, at the age of five, there was still one little boy with polio in my class, this scourge of children. As recently as 1988, there were 125 countries where polio was rampant. Today, the figure is two. So this process of globalization has brought us vast benefits. These are not to be tossed aside lightly by the forces, and I know people will think I'm talking about the United States, but I'm talking about every democratic country because the politics are the same everywhere, where the extreme left and the extreme right seem to agree very readily that international trade and globalization is a very bad thing. And... Uh, as I say, it's not just an American phenomenon. And we need to stand up against those forces. We see what the benefits are. And as one of my great American friends that I'm sure you, Matt, know, uh, Alan Wolf, pointed out to those who constantly criticize globalization, yes, you're right, Alan said, a rising tide does not lift all boats but a stagnant pond raises none. So there are serious threats out there, ladies and gentlemen, and the people that are here on this stage, and many of you I know will share this, we actually need to know that there are costs associated with these wonderful new words, greater resilience, friend shoring, localization, fragmented global. This is not some magical way forward. There will be costs with this. There's nothing intrinsically wrong, for example, with friendshoring. There will be certain countries deeply regretting the degree of dependence they put on Russian energy for their industrial processes. So it's not something which is black and white. It is a question of degree. And I, having spent my entire professional life trying to advance, I know it sounds corny to say, international peaceful cooperation, but that's exactly what I and all the people like me were trying to do. Just remember, this can be taken far too far. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Ambassador Grosser, uh, for your uh, views and uh, advice, uh, really. Thank you very much. Now, uh, next, uh, we now invite uh, uh, Mr. Hartingen Go. Uh, he was the um, Minister Deng, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, friends, thank you very much. I'll begin with, uh, sorry, uh, there you are. Right. Uh, from a macro level, I'm going to take you down into a, a little bit more micro detail no? and to discuss something that is uh, going to be an existential crisis for all of us. And the reason for that is because we need to have this discussion in order to move forward, looking at how we could forge a, a resilient supply chain. There is no doubt that the Taiwan and the Philippines has a great bilateral exchange. And this slide tells us the importance of Taiwan in terms of in, in its investment. But moving along, we know that this investment oftentimes comes in the form of technology, manufacturing, products. But one of the things I learned is that the investment in human resource also comes in. That soft skills is very important. What can we draw from here in terms of parallelism for healthcare? What commodities are available in the health trade? Normally, we think about pharmaceutical, medicine, devices. We talk about education and investment in professional skills, training. But one of the things I think we neglect is value formation for human resource for health. When we talk about the resilient supply chain, again, we focus on 
big strategies, products, and technology, and which is important. But we sometimes forget the critical role of human health resource. And let me explain. <clears throat> Trade can also be seen from the perspective of science and technology where knowledge is shared. Secondly, best practices is shared. We've seen that from the previous panelist's presentation. But human capital, this social value exchange, social development, is something we should not ignore. Under the pandemic uh, scenario over the past few years, we have seen the greatest scale of human and global cooperation. Fantastic. But we also saw, unfortunately, behaviors that were, shall we say, asymmetric of power where there were vaccine nationalism. We saw also the weakness of the regulatory sector. In a recent meeting we had in Singapore, this was highlighted. The WHO estimated that in terms of global shortages of human health resource, we will reach something like 13 million uh, professionals by the year 2035. Take note, this is global. So this is an existential problem. If we talk about resilient supply chain, it is not just in the technology, but we need to focus our attention with humans as well. Questions we need to ask if we were to move forward in this exchange uh, for the future, do we have the right numbers? Secondly, what are the skills and competency that will give us, shall we say, a balanced portfolio between primary healthcare, public health, and that of advanced uh, medical intervention? And also, lastly, are the willing, is there the willingness of health workers to work in difficult area? We found out that healthcare professionals do not normally follow the law of supply and demand. If we were to borrow industry value chain, we talk about raw material, the standards and licensing, all the way to finished product and its distribution, we can equate this to human resource like production and education, professional licensing and certification. Lastly, their employment, deployment, compensation. So health, we understand, is a human basic need. But what we're seeing now is a big problem. Rich countries whose citizens are a bit hesitant to take up uh, healthcare professional uh, studies now have to import large cohort of health professionals from countries with weak health system. So what is wrong in this market scenario is something we need to discuss for the future. Not many, many countries around the world have fragmentation of healthcare. There's inequitous uh, access to healthcare, and this describes a weak health service and system. And we ask ourselves, what then will be the future of our healthcare around the world? And what can we contribute as global citizens? The Economist in 2023 highlighted in the next five and 25 years the different advances that they forecast will happen, including genomics, uh, AI in healthcare decision medical support, and uh, human and computer interface. So our problems that we are concerned with human resource for health includes the following shortage of health worker, and we need to deal with it as soon as possible, rapidly expanding health information and the rise of technology, how can we balance the technology with human resource lack? And what we need would be shared values, education, technology, and health training. Next generation, should be, we should be thinking of them, and we should think of human capital as a public good, not merely commodities of trade. And the application of bilateral economic diplomacy might be very important to solve this problem. So I, I enjoined you by sharing possible four areas for consideration, for joint collaboration, uh, the importance of improving human capital, the use of ICT in health service and insurance cover, the development of vaccine life cycle, and lastly, do not forget the value of joint regulatory harmonization. I think APEC has started doing something like this years ago. I think we need to sustain and continue this and scale up. And uh, the best way to predict the future, of course, is for us to create it. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, uh, Mr. Hartinger. Uh, I, uh, I want uh, to uh, thank all the panelists for the information you provided and uh, the advice you gave. Uh, this is uh, certainly a very, very useful uh, session. 
uh, to me. I personally learn a lot. Uh, I think uh, you shall uh, also have the uh, same uh, feeling. Uh, but because of the uh, time limits, so I don't think uh, we can have the uh, question and answer uh, session. And, uh, but they are all available. And uh, so it's very easy uh, that through the foundation that we can uh, reach them. And uh, I do encourage you to do that. So uh, can I now announce the conclusion of this session by asking the uh, participants to give a big round of, of applause to the panelists. So thank you very much. Thank you very much to the moderator and the panelists. Please come to the center of the stage for a photo call. Thank you very much. Once again, a round of applause to the wonderful sharing. Please come closer and look at our photographer in the front. <coughs> All right, thumbs up. Give us your thumbs up, please. <coughs> All right. Thank you very much. Thank you to the moderator and the panelists for the wonderful discussion. Ladies and gentlemen, now we're going to take a quick break. Please come back here at 11.15. 11.15. Please help yourself to the refreshments outside. And our next session will begin at 11.15. Thank you. <coughs> 